bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day that you've given us this beautiful day and this opportunity to come together in the middle of the week and sing psalms of praise and offer our prayers to you and study your word. We thank you, Father, that we live in a place where we can gather together when we choose and worship as we choose. We worship you in spirit and truth. Father, we pray that as we study your message tonight, the words that you have given us in the scripture, that we would open our hearts and minds and take this lesson to heart and apply it to our lives and be better Christians tomorrow than we were today. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you pour out on us. We, we thank you truly now for greener pastures and Father, the signs of spring and one more indication that you are truly in charge and you always will be. Father, you are the beginning and the end. We love you for everything that you do for us. Father, we pray for any that are sick, those that were mentioned tonight, and those that are on a prayer list. We know you are a mighty God and we pray that you would heal them. But in all things, Father, we pray that your will would be done. Father, we, we just cannot thank you enough for this country that you've given us. We, we, we would pray that the people that lead us would lead us in such a way that we might have peace. Most of all, Father, we thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he come to this earth and live the perfect life and that we would have his words recorded for us to study and that we would have his example of how to live recorded for us to use an example of how we are to conduct ourselves on this earth. It is in his holy name we pray. Amen. Again, it's good to have everyone here tonight, whether you're in person or online. We're glad that you can be with us. We had a series of lessons that ended up last week on, you know, doing the will of God. There are scriptures that say this is the will of God concerning you, or this is God's will for you. And we talked about some principles that are laid out in the scripture that tell us about God's will, and, um, you know, we, we finished up on that series of lessons last week, talking a little bit about, among other things, God's providential will. But I was looking for some things to, to begin a new series of studies about, and had um, somebody hand me a booklet, The Voice of Truth, in, I think it's Voice of Truth International, it's what it's called, a little booklet that Charles, I meant to say, um, J.C. Choate out of Winona, Mississippi, began to publish years ago. Uh, it has a lot of information in it, and it had a two-page spread over some of the sins of the tongue. I mean, it was one verse after another, one comment after another. I didn't realize how many sins you can commit with your tongue until I read that, but it got me to thinking about the tongue, and, and the person said, you know, maybe you want to use that for a basis of some lessons, and I thought, well, you know, not only should we look at the negative, we need to look at the positive and, and talk a little bit about the tongue itself. It made me think of a story I, I heard about a young man that worked in a grocery store, and he was over the produce department, and, you know, he was proud of his produce department in that small grocery store. Well, uh, a lady, a rather mature lady came in, and she, um, approached the young man and she looked at the she's looking at the heads of lettuce and she said you know these heads of lettuce are just too big can i have a half a le head of lettuce and he said ma'am we don't sell half heads we have to sell them by a whole head and she goes well it will ruin if i get a whole head i only need a half a head and they went back and forth and and he, he said look lady we just do not sell half a heads of lettuce do you want me to go talk to the manager and she goes that'd be mighty sweet of you if you would well he went up to the front, stomped up there, found the manager, and he said, there is this crazy lady back in, in produce demanding a half a head of lettuce. And she, he went on questioning the woman's intellect, talking about how unreasonable she was. And finally, the manager pointed, and he looked over his shoulder and saw that lady had followed him up. You know, And he goes, yes, that, there's a crazy woman that wants a half a head of lettuce, and this sweet lady here wants the other half. <laughs> and the manager later cornered him and said, boy, you're fast on your thinking there. How did you learn to be so swift in thinking of comebacks? He goes, well, to tell you the truth, I was born and raised in Grand Rapids. And I have nothing against Grand Rapids, by the way. But he said, I was born and raised in Grand Rapids, and we're known for two things, our hockey team and ugly women. And he said, you got to be quick on the comeback. And the manager goes, my wife is from Grand Rapids. 
And he goes, well, what hockey team does she play for? So, <laughs> so anyway, you know, we can get ourselves in trouble sometimes with the things we say. And sometimes we might can get ourselves out of it. Other times, I think we dig the hole deeper. And, and we need to be careful of what we say. I think we all realize that. Um, Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Let no corrupt word. So how many corrupt words are supposed to come out of our mouth? None. You know, I think sometimes we can think, well, you know, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I, I, it's only every once in a while I let, I let some slip there or whatever. But our goal is to let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. We'll talk a little bit about corrupt words in a minute. It contrasts it. What, what is a corrupt word? It's, it's the opposite of what we're going to see on the rest of this. He said, instead of corrupt words coming out of your mouth, what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. What's edification? What's that word mean? Instruction? Encouragement? I'd always, growing up, you know, we had the word edify, and I was always told it means to build up. You know, you build up, you encourage, you instruct, you, you, you help build. Instead of tearing people down, you build them up. There's, there's, that's part of the work of the church. I mean, we evangelize, but there's edification building up the church and, and, and teaching and admonishing and encouraging. And he says, do words that are necessary for edification, not corrupt words. Impart, that may impart grace to the hearers. What does it mean to impart grace? How do we impart grace? Benefit. Okay, benefit. That's a good answer. What else? Anything else? I mean, we talk about God's grace, God's favor, really unmerited favor to us. Uh, you know, he, the benefits that he gives to us. Uh, but now we, we should be doing that and saying that which imparts grace is beneficial to, to others. Um, so instead of corrupt words, that, which would be the opposite of this, it's that which edifies that which imparts grace. So uh, he said that's our goal to have those type of words. Ephesians 5 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. I mean, he said, here's some actions that should not be in your life at all as a Christian. Here's, some, here's an attitude as well. But he said, because it's, you know, it's not fitting for saints. But then he says, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving a thanks. Foolish talking. What's, what, what do you think of when you think of foolish talking? Bill Maher. Okay. Bill Maher? Okay, if you, if you want... If you, he covers every one of them. <laughs> If you, if you watch many of the, uh, if it doesn't watch certain liberal TV shows with, um, are, are aware of them, you'll know what, who he's talking about there as far as his very liberal and harsh and... I only see when they put him on Fox to make an example. Right. <laughs> but, but now, um, I mean, there, there are some, I mean, you can look on TV and you can see, like you say, you can see people that are supposed to be supposedly wise and intellectual that fit every single one of these, as you said, but... Are people that just talk foolishness? And there, you know, there's a lot of people that talk foolish things when it comes to religion, when it comes to life in general. Coarse jesting. What's coarse jesting? Joking. Okay, joking. Okay, jesting is joking. What's coarse joking? I, I, you, you think about telling something that's filthy or dirty or that that is crude. Things which are not fitting. You know, he said, "There's things that are fitting." You know, um, where the scripture talks about people. You know, neither did they blush. I think is one of the things. And we live in a society that doesn't blush about much of anything anymore. You know, they, they, they're not ashamed. There's just some things that are fitting and proper, and other things that are not. He says, "Look, instead of saying things you shouldn't say and being involved in things that are words that you shouldn't use or, or attitudes in, in the speech that you shouldn't have." Give thanks. Do things that are, that are thankful and encouraging. So, I mean, in other words, our speech is important. We know James 3. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. That's not, now, by the way, that verse is not an excuse to keep from teaching. I mean, I think some people look at that and say, that's why I don't teach. It says, be not many of you teachers, and I'm, I don't feel like I need to become a teacher because, you know, I'm, there's people that are more qualified than me. That's not what he's saying here. 
What is he saying? As a te- about a teaching. Teach the truth. Be careful what you teach. You need to be prepared when you teach to make sure that it is the truth. But you know... Okay, there's a responsibility that goes with There's a blessing as well when you teach people, but there's a responsibility. By the way, be not, let not many of you become teachers. What does it mean to be a teacher? Who, you know, I'm teaching the class right now. We have some ladies downstairs that are teaching some children's classes downstairs right now. I, you know... Okay. Okay, a Christian is a teacher. What were you going to say? I was just going to say the stricter judgment comes when you don't teach the truth. And we're speaking about scripture. Right. When you don't base it on the word. Right. And you put yourself, if you stand up for a teacher and you start teaching something that is your opinion. Okay. People can get up here and they can try to bind their opinion on other people and, and, and do that. We have to be careful there. And, and there's some that will get up there and teach and say, they'll, they'll actually say, you know, so you read something in the scripture and they'll say, well, that doesn't really mean that, you know. And they'll try to push it away as well. And so there, there's going to be a, a, you know, you're going to be held accountable. I'm going to be held accountable. But what it's going to say on the teachers is it's not just a person that stands up here like I am or like the ladies downstairs are doing right now or others that might teach a Bible class. We have one on one personal Bible studies at time. We have people that are putting some videos online teaching as well, and that's part of it. But really, aren't we all teaching in some shape, form, or fashion? I mean, whether we're teaching our children or our grandchildren, whether by our example we are teaching. I mean, I'm not, I know this is talking about something that may be a little bit different, but you can carry that same principle. You have to be careful in the things that you teach. Um, you know, because sometimes, you know, we, we need to be prepared there and, and know what we're talking about. I was helping somebody the other day, and, and those that were involved in this will know who, who was helping and what happened. But um, I helped somebody do a repair and got it going. I, and I was bragging to somebody at church. I said, you know, we did that repair for X hundred dollars, I think like under $300, and it was going to cost over $1,700 to get it done. By that time, the person I'd helped do it came in and says, guess what, it's not working. <laughs> and the other person goes, you know, sometimes... Do what? A door? Yeah. And so anyway, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. But anyway, no. Um, anyway, it was going to be... It, um, now you just derailed my train. But anyway. <laughs> no, but anyway, somebody goes, it's worth paying the extra money there sometime. Well, it turned out it just needed a little bit of, adjust, a little bit of adjusting on something. and it, it It's closing and locking, right? Okay, I got a thumbs up back there. It is... He, he, he's not going to totally humiliate me here in front of everybody. He may tell you otherwise. It's, it's working. But anyway, sometimes you do what you got to do. But what I'm saying is, you know, sometimes you, get, you do get what you pay for. I mean, um, and in my case, they got what they paid for. So, but the, the point is, uh, you know, sometimes when, and I never said I can do a perfect job on whatever I was doing and that, everything and all that. But with that same principle, sometimes we can jump in on something that, you know, it's over our head. I remember as a child one time, falling in a swimming pool and it was over my head and I was out in the middle laying on the bottom of the pool three years old and luckily my dad saw me and jumped in and, and saved me. You, you, get, you get to drown in there. And I went around and told everybody I drowned. But um, sometimes we can do that when it comes to our teaching. We need to be prepared and be careful. But, but still, take on that responsibility if you're prepared for it. But he said we stumble in many things. If you don't stumble in word, how many never stumble in word? If you say you don't, you just stumbled. In it. Um, he's a perfect man. He's able to buy the whole body. He said, look, this is something we all deal with. Some of us may have more trouble with it than others, but all of us at, time have, at times have trouble with, um, with things that we say or maybe neglect to say at times. And he says, think about this. You can put a bit in a horse's mouth and turn a big horse around with a small bit. You can take a big ship with a small rudder and turn a big ship around. And he says, the tongue is little. But it can boast great things. It just takes a little spark to start a big forest fire. And he said, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. 
The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body, sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. There's a big warning there, isn't it? There's power there. And it can be power to destroy, but also you can harness that power and you can build it up. And I said, look, you can take and you can you you can tame just about any kind of what's this? Every kind of beast and bird, reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can truly tame the tongue. It's something that we have to deal with and work on because it's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And so don't take it for granted. Don't take it lightly. Be serious about the things we say. We, some people, it says we bless God, bless God, our Father, and then we turn around and curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. You know, these are things that should not be. Do you get a spring that sends forth fresh and bitter water at the same opening? A fig tree that bears olives or a grapevine that bears figs? No. I mean, and, and our salt water that comes and fresh comes out of the same spring? No. I mean, he said in the same way, don't have that blessing and cursing coming forth out of the same mouth. And he's not saying choose to curse. You know? I mean, he, the idea is choose to do the blessing part there. And so it's important what we say. And then the, kind of the title for our series of lessons, and you can see it from the little thing at the top if you can read that. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Proverbs 25, 11. Any idea what it means to be apples of gold in settings of silver? A lot has been written on that. It's, it's, funny, it's funny the things that people would t- kind of analyze. Do what? Those are two desirable things. Okay. And your speech is desirable. Okay. I mean, you think about just the silver and gold part. It's valuable, it's beautiful, it's precious. Um, you know, I don't, think, I don't think it's necessarily talking about a golden, delicious apple. Someone had, one commentator said it's perhaps, you know, with, with all that Solomon had, the gifts he had received, all the beauty that he had around him, it's very likely that there was a, a setting or some will say a pitcher, um, a container made out of silver that had beautiful, ornate gold apples, apples made out of gold in it. Kind of like people will put decorations on their table or centerpieces on our table. That there may have been something there that he was looking at and just thought how beautiful that is. And he said, you know, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and set into silver. Something that's very beautiful and it's very valuable. Not the word that's that fire destroying, but a word that's fitly spoken. Power for good, power for evil in the tongue. In, in the rest of the lesson, we go look at the book of Proverbs and look at a few things about the destructive side of it. Next week, we'll go to some things with the constructive side, the positive side. But the destructive use of the tongue, what James was warning us about, and again, this is from the book of Proverbs, is mentioned quite a few times in Proverbs, and there's lying. Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. You know, it doesn't just say God doesn't like it. It's an abomination to him. So, you know, God doesn't like, he doesn't put up with the lying lips. He wants people that deal truthfully. Uh, Proverbs 6, beginning verse 16, mentions six things the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. And that's kind of a poetic way of saying, you know, you use six and then seven. I mean, it's, it's a poetic way of saying, here are seven things that the Lord does not like. He hates, they're an abomination. And I, I just mentioned the first two here, a proud look, and then he says, a lying tongue. We excuse a lot of things. You know, we categorize a little white lie versus you know, a big lie or whatever, but that, that lying tongue. Why do people lie? Okay, to keep from telling the truth? Okay. Why would they not want to tell the truth? Might get them in trouble. <laughs> Here's one example here in Proverbs 10:18. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips. Whoever spreads slander is a fool. Some people lie to hide hatred. How can you lie to hide hatred? What's the way somebody can lie to hide hatred? Pretend like you love somebody when you really don't. You know, you know I think we may have all had people that sometime in our life, and maybe you've been blessed not to, but had someone in your life that acts like they're your friend and that they're there for you and we say they stab you in the back or they're talking nice to your face and then talking bad about you behind and, and you find out later oh they said all kinds of wonderful things to me but I found out 
they hated me, you know. And, and there was some hate, there was hatred there. And so some people will be deceitful, lying to the person when they hate them behind the back. Why would they not come out sometimes and tell that person how they feel? Why would they want to lie and hide it? Okay. Yes, I'm... Now, now you, you never have trouble with that, though, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to get in trouble for think, the little comments I'm making here. Now, I go, I'm going to have to come forward. I already had one comment earlier I'm on somebody with announcements. So anyway, I'm just, I'm just picking and having bad, probably bad jesting. I, I apologize. I'm, I mean, at least you can keep up with the list of what I'm giving. I'm giving examples tonight is what it is. Um, it's hard, yes. I mean... And, and sometimes we do it just to, you can do things to get a laugh, and it, but it can be at someone else's expense too. But I mean, the idea, you know, sometimes somebody has hard feelings or somebody, they just tell them how they feel. But a lot of times it's not that way. As, as I said just a moment ago, Sydney said, it may be because that person's beneficial to you in some way, so you don't want to sever that relationship, so you try to cover it up. And, you know, they don't really tell their true feelings, the, the lying that's there. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. By the way, it says he lays up deceit within himself. Who is he deceiving? I mean, not just others. He's deceiving himself, really, isn't he? Like it's okay to be that way or, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's all going to be okay. No one's ever going to figure it out. I mean, you just, or, you know, maybe they try to justify it before God. When he, talking about the person who just is hiding that hate and disguising it, when he speaks kindly, do not believe him. For there are seven abominations in his heart. What's it mean when it says there's seven abominations? Okay, it's not saying count the seven points there. It's like you say, seven is that perfect or complete number. His heart is filled with, you know, sometimes there's a person that you, you know you know how they, you may know how they feel, but, but then you listen to the things they say, well, maybe he really means it, you know, and, and you want to believe, but he says, you know, here's this person that, that you know that the, the hatred that's there, you know the animosity that's there, and then all of a sudden they come up speaking all these flowery words and, and, and speaking kindly, and it's one thing if they come up and ask for forgiveness or whatever and try to seek to make things right, but, but we know what we're talking about, those, those words there trying to cover it up, and it says, understand that heart is filled with abomination. And guess what's going to come out? You know, it's not going to be, it's not the truth that's coming out. And, um, you know, we have, to be, we have to be careful there. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will, will be revealed before the assembly. Well, I say it all comes out in the wash. It all comes out in the end. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. You ever dug a pit and fall into it? I hope not. Um, Somewhere up north, there was a cemetery that, that they, just here recently, they, they dug out the graves by hand. I mean, just old-fashioned grave diggers um, dug out the graves, and there was a man that was down in the bottom of a grave, seven foot down. I mean, I've always heard six foot, but he was down seven foot, and it caved in on him and became his grave. I mean, it killed him before they could dig him back out. You know, digging that pit and falling into it. I mean, now, he was, built, he was digging it for a good purpose. But what are some reasons people dig a pit? What are some of the reasons besides for a grave? As a trap, to you know, you can kind of dig a, a deep hole and then put something across it so an, a an animal goes across it or you have some bait where he goes out to get it and then he falls in. You sure don't want to fall in the pit that still has an injured, still live animal in it. That would not be good at all. You don't want to fall into one anyway. But you see, imagine digging a pit and you get caught in your own trap. You fall into your own pit. Back some many years ago when our children were little, we had some work on our grease trap and it was opened up and it was a, it's a deep, big one. And I leaned over about that time Clay tripped and knocked me in the back and I went flying head first, headed toward that grease, I mean, going down to that grease trap. I had a shovel on my hand. It just, and it wasn't because I was agile. It just happened to land just right and catch across that grease trap. And I held on and kept from going head first. And 
I think I told Clay, you're lucky I didn't go on in, you know, because I, I, I wouldn't have, I would have needed this lesson probably. But anyway, the, the point is, it was, you know, I almost fell in the pit, I almost fell in the, the grease trap. You, but you dig a pit trying to trap someone else, and you get caught in it. He who rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. You're trying to roll a stone on someone else, and it comes back, and it, it hits you or harms you. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it. A flattering mouth works ruin. A lying tongue can crush someone. You know, say sticks and stones, but, you know, words can hurt. But, you know, you're trying to crush someone, but they, they hate the one being crushed by it. But ultimately, who's being crushed by those words? They are. And sometimes it may be that they hate themselves as well, you know. I mean, I don't, you know, sometimes people may have a low self-esteem or a, hate, a self-hatred and, and they take it out on others, but whatever the case may be, and then the flattering mouth works ruin. Um, the truthful lips shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. We may get a spy for a while, but it catches up with us after a while. Getting treasures by a lying tongue is the fleeting fantasy of those who seek death. <laughs> that puts it kind of bluntly, doesn't it? You think you're, you got this fantasy of getting treasure, but you're really seeking death by doing that. Then there's flattery. You know, flattery is lying, isn't it? You're, you're heaping praise upon someone um, not out of sincerity. Why would people flatter, flatter someone? Why, why would somebody use flattery, insincere praise of that person? Do what? Um, you know, if I go into a store where you have salesmen that you can tell when, when the salesmen are working off commission, I mean, they, they're there and they're doing what the salesmen do. They try to sell. And, and I don't, you know, if, whether it's a car or whatever else it may be, you go in there and you're listening to the person. I don't mind the person being there telling me what I need to know and answering questions and offering maybe some suggestions. But then there's some that they, they start, they, they, you, they start flattering you and they try to make you really feel good, you know, all this stuff. But then the whole time I can just see they're kind of, I can feel that net being cast over me that, or they're, they, they got the hook in me trying to reel me in. And I put up that wall. I mean, when I, when I feel like they're using that flattery or trying to use that dis, kind of deceitful, like I'm their best friend they've ever had in their life, I, my defenses go up. If, they, if they're, I like the low-key sales, sales thing. So if you try to sell me something, get very low-key with it and, and just, just show it to me and you might get a sale. But anyway, um, I shouldn't have said that over, over the Internet. Should have. But, it, but anyway, the flattery. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it. A flattering mouth works ruin. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. That's where you want something. You're spreading a net, you're fixing to yank it, and, and you're trying to flatter them to get what you want. But really, it's you that's caught in the net and that are being pulled under. There's gossip as well. What is gossip? You could say a tale, a tale bearer. Okay. Okay. You know, um, and we'll talk, we're going to talk more about this next week as well on the gossip part probably. But a talebearer, you know, you hear what we say, juicy gossip. You hear a story about somebody that you know you probably really shouldn't say anything about it to someone else, but it's, it's, it's such an interesting story. Or it's, it's, such, it's something that, oh boy, everybody liked to hear that and, and spread it around. A talebearer reveals those secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals the matter. He's not saying that you conceal something evil and sinful i mean in a sense like if you had a, a, a person supposed to be your fellow christian they came out and said guess what i did yesterday i robbed a bank i got all the money stashed in my closet well you say well i can't gossip i better not tell anybody that's not is that what it means that's not what it means is it uh, but i mean we understand the, the the gossip we can also understand the danger with the gossip as well the problems there's there's things that we hear and it says, if you cover a transgression, you're seeking love. But if you repeat the matter, you can even separate friends. An ungodly man digs up evil. It's on his lips like a burning fire. A perverse man. He said, here's a perverse man. He sows strife. A whisperer separates things. Do you know what so-and-so said about you? Know what they say. And then you go to, you know, then you tell that person, you know, the other person, you say, you know what they said about you? And back and forth, and you can sit, sit back or stand back and watch the fireworks. I've had several situations in my life over, over the years, and every once in a while I can learn something along the way. But, you know, I've, I've, you know every, everywhere you go, everywhere you've been, there's always going to be some people that don't get along. And, you know, and, and I've, every, you know I, I can think back, even when I was younger, I kind of figured this out along the way. 
There were, there were some that they would say, you know, I can't stand so-and-so. And then the other person would say, I can't stand so-and-so back. And they both talked bad about the other one. And I, in all, I like both people, but they didn't like each other. And I tried a time or two on some, like I, I tell this person, you know what they said about you? No, what they say. And I said, they said that you can be a pretty good person. They said that? Yeah. And then I go here, you know what this person said about you? They said that some of the things you said were nice, you know, because that comment that, that I said was nice. You know, I, I, and you go back, and they really said that, and you kind of go back and forth, start repeating the good. And I tried that for a while, and it actually broke down the wall on, on, on one situation where people that had not talked in a while began to talk. And um, I think they finally let some old habits creep back in, went back to like they were, but, you know, just trying to, Sometimes there's good things we can try to repeat to help, but there's bad things we can do to destroy. Be, be careful with the gossip. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no tailbearer, strife cease. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. That speaks for itself. The words of a tailbearer are like tasty trifles. They go down into the inmost body. Ooh, I got some juicy gossip for you. You know, that's kind of the picture there. Instead of doing that, debate your case with your neighbor. Go to them. Do not disclose a secret to another, lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation. Don't go and sp spread something that you've heard about someone. Go to that person and talk to him and say, you know, here, let's work this out. Or, uh, you know, what can I do to help or whatever? Because you don't want your shameful things to be spread, and you shouldn't do that for them either. And then a whole perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Let's have that wholesome tongue. Let's have a word fitly spoken. Don't have that. He said the opposite of that is a perverse tongue. And we'll, we'll look at more next week, and we'll take up on Romans 10 in just a moment, but we'll look more, a little bit more on some things about the gossip, and then, then we'll go turn our attention to some positive things. Any other comments? Yeah, we'll get into in some future lessons. We are going to get into like you're talking about euphemisms, uh, per, like per, what you know, because there's things about profanity and um, you know, and, and then euphemism, different things. And we're going to look at what the scriptures have to say along those lines. Any other comments? I appreciate the discussion tonight. Looking at um, a word fitly spoken and talking about the positive and negatives as far as our speech is concerned, things we should not say or should not um, profess with our mouth, and then. We'll look at some things that are positive as well. One of those positives that we can use our mouth for is in Romans chapter 10. It says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. To use our mouth to confess, to profess our faith in Jesus Christ, to believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died but that he rose again from the dead. To have faith in, in Jesus as a son of God. He says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. It comes from your heart. I mean, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And within our heart, it should be that faith in Jesus Christ that we profess, that we confess to others. With the heart one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. To call on the name of the Lord. It's, it's interesting as he points them to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and talks about as you call out to the Lord, as you call on his name, you call out and, and, and profess your faith. Peter said much the same thing in Acts chapter 2. He quoted from the same Old Testament reference here that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and those people that believe that message, they had faith in it. I mean, and he talked about that here in this scripture as well, that if you believe in the heart, in Acts 2, they believed it. And they wanted to know what they needed to do. They were calling out, what shall we do? You know, by Christ's authority, and he, you know, as you're preaching in Jesus, what would he have me to do to be saved? Is what they're saying. And he told them, those who believed, that they needed to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. To have their sins forgiven. To be buried with Christ, to rise up is the picture given there. And thousands of people did that that day. He goes on in Romans 10 and says, they have not all obeyed the gospel. I mean, he's talking about faith that comes from the heart. He's talking about faith in Jesus Christ, that the Son of God that calls, that, 
that causes us to call out wanting to know what we need to do to be saved, to profess our faith in Jesus. But then he ties in with it as well, obedience. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. If you believe is obedient, belief, obedient faith there. Because he says, Lord, who has believed our report, but they have not all obeyed those used interchangeably there. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We know what God's word says, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he, as we have just mentioned, died and rose again the third day, that there, his purpose for dying on the cross was for our sins. And his resurrection gives us hope of rising up never to die again. Do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Do you believe that he died and rose again? Do you believe from the heart the things that he has told you that you must do in order to be saved? Then why not do what those people on the day of Pentecost did when they believed in Jesus and they called out? They repented of their sins and they were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. If you need to do that tonight, why not do that? If you need to respond in any way, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? Would you bow with me, please? Our holy and righteous Heavenly Father, as we come to the close of another day in this life, Father, we're so thankful for so many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Also, Father, we're so thankful that we could come together here tonight and hear another portion of your word. Father, we pray that we'll put it in our hearts and our minds and be stronger in the future than we were in the past. Father, we're so thankful for this congregation that meets here. Father, we pray for the leadership, and we pray that they will continue to be strong. Go with us now, Father, throughout this day and throughout the further walks of life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.